So I'm assuming that you don't know a whole lot about uh, 18th century British writing. Is that correct? Irish also, lexicography. Um, but you may have, if you've ever looked at old books, you've noticed that they look strange. And sometimes if you've looked at books that are even older, that spelling is irregular. And you're like, why are they doing this? How come they don't have respect for the rules? Uh, it's, it's mostly because there weren't rules. Uh, and so the concept of spelling, regularization, and grammar, and things like that were just beginning to be set and asserted at the middle to the end of the 18th century. And there was actually so much going on at that time that what's fascinating and interesting is uh, education, literacy, uh, women's rights, the rights of minorities, politics, all of these things are coming together. And I find this to be about the most important and interesting time uh, to study, particularly when I get to talk to my own students about this because I teach uh, legal studies students. And they really need to know why and how our, uh, the United States Constitution and some of our uh, founding legal documents became that way. Uh, we've been hearing about the Second Amendment lately, for example. And one of the issues is uh, why a particular comma is placed where it is, and that makes a huge difference in meaning. So really, this stuff matters. Uh, so one of the most important, but I think less well-known people writing about English and Irish literature in the 18th century, late 18th and early 19th century, was Mariah Edgeworth. And mostly people are now understanding her name to be pronounced Mariah instead of Maria. Uh, you'll notice that uh, you have Maria Edgeworth and then, and by Richard Lovell Edgeworth. So that is her father. And she and her father wrote and published many, many books. And it's not entirely clear who was the primary or even original author of some of these books. But they were co-authors. Uh, so you'll see his name on these documents. And I go back and forth when I write and talk about it. I try to be more consistent when I write. It's not easy. Uh, I go back and forth between saying Edgeworth or the Edgeworths, because you can't really know. So uh, anyway, one of the things that Mariah Edgeworth, well, she's more important as a novelist. And she and her father wrote pedagogical texts and uh, works for children. So in that sense, they were kind of working hand in hand. Uh, so one of the things that was important to the Edgeworths was uh, learning and teaching about some of the educational philosophies as well as the political philosophies that were kind of flourishing around this time. Uh, so during the Romantic period, which was in England, around the 1780s and went a little bit over into the 19th century until about the early uh, 1900, uh, 1800s. So you've got the Romantic period. And one of the most important concepts was the idea of people having sensory awareness and people having sensitivity to things. And there was an idea that children were people and children were like separate people from just short adults. And they were needing to be raised with a kind of understanding that had not been presented in, in terms of pedagogical needs and um, awareness. So students and children were being considered as a real audience. And their brains and minds were being also considered as needing to be formed and being formed in good and useful ways. And so the Edgeworths were fairly prominent in the sense that they were using some of these theories and ideas about how children were 
sort of blank slates and you filled their minds with information and you were good and kind and decent to them as opposed to, you know, passing them off to uh, an instructor or uh, sending them off to the nursery. So that parents were all, and well, still mothers, but also parents, were having a, uh, a place in their children's education in a way that was kind of new. So, and you have practical education. And what they're doing is obviously practical related to practice. So they're asking students, children, to actually do things instead of memorize things, instead of read things and recite them back. So this is also new. Students, children are asked to have uh, writing books. They're asked to write in books. I don't know about you, but when I was in school, I didn't own my books. We rented them from the school, so we were told never to even you know, touch them with a pen or pencil. So we have, uh, in the 18th century, writers of children's literature and children's books or books for children asking their students to write in them. And it's kind of, when you think about that paper was expensive, it's kind of like shocking. But that's what they would do. So they wanted students and children and parents to actually do these things instead of hear about them or uh, read about them. So uh, the, uh, the Edgeworths wrote a huge number of books. And so one of the first books was The Parent's Assistant. And that was a book of lessons for parents about teaching their own children. She uh, published, and so that was 1796. There were stories for children. So these weren't uh, stories that were written for parents but read to children. These were actually for children. Uh, we have early lessons. That was 1801, and I'm going to read to you and give you some information from early lessons. And then we have practical education, and that is, uh, let's see, 1796, 1798. And so the thing about practical lessons is you've only got a couple of pages of this, but uh, in both of the volumes, and I have, this is, a facsimile edition from Cambridge. And so the pages are pretty big. And there's two volumes of these. So the, the, the idea is that this was for a parent to use and then take and share with the children. Because it would be way too big for children to look at and to, to carry around. Uh, so what they wanted to do was educate children fairly, decently, and in new ways. And this, it's actually kind of interesting because some of this, the theories and ideas that they were promoting then are relevant today. And I think they're probably seeing kind of a resurgence. So it's kind of important, though, to look at how the English language was being looked at or considered in new and different ways uh, during this time. So she was in heavily invested in promoting the teaching of language as well as understanding language. She lived in Ireland her entire life. However, she was of an upper class. So she's called Anglo-Irish. So that would be, I could give you an entire history lesson about the Anglo-Irish, but she was of English ancestry living in Ireland. And she was, because of that, like I said, of an upper class. But she was still highly in interested in the education and development of the Irish people, uh, regardless of their class. So she wrote a couple of very important books for my field. One of them was called Castle Rackrent, which made fun of 
the uh, way that there were absentee landlords and the sort of system of landlording and tenantry. And then she wrote something called Essay on Irish Bulls, which was about the Irish language. And it was trying to introduce the Irish language to the English people. Um, so anyway, so she was for adults writing about language and then also for children. So in practical education, for example, she writes, the art of teaching is to invent, awakening and assisting the inventive power by daily exercise and excitement and by the applications of philosophic rules to principal occurrences. And what that means is that she's trying to encourage parents. And when I say parents, I really do mean, for the most part, mothers. But she does include fathers periodically. And when I say children, I mean that she actually doesn't make a distinction between girls and boys, which is unusual at that time. Uh, so anyway, she's trying to get parents and children to take advantage of this practice. So she wants mundane examples from daily life to teach. So she thinks that practicing life and practicing education can help people become moral beings. Um, so she provides useful anecdotal examples for children. She develops through that an ideology of education that considers the environment to be crucial. Uh, the pedagogical works show that her perspective is more descriptive learning than prescriptive. So most people at that time were, do this because I'm telling you it's right. And she says, do this and you'll find out why it's right. And you'll see it yourself. And then do it again. <laughs> so that is one of the more interesting things about what Edgeworth does. Uh, so she, she kind of does some interesting sort of pre-psychological uh, philosophy. When I used to teach with the psychologist, I picked up some interesting ideas. And one of the things that Edgeworth had, had been promoting for a couple of centuries by then um, is the idea of automaticity. And I, when I desc describe automaticity to my students, I'll say, do you know how to get to school? And they say, of course. And I said, right, because you do it every day and you practice it, you don't think about it. Yes? What is the word you said? Auto automaticity. Can you spell that? Sure. A-U, well, um, <laughs> help, <laughs> automatic -icity. So, um, thank you. So automaticity. So the idea is the getting something embedded in one's long-term memory. I talk to my students about going to a particular doctor on the Upper East Side once a year. And I say, do you think I know how to get there? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, no. I have to relearn every year because I only go once a year. Every day I go to school, therefore I don't even have to think about it. And in fact, when I need to take the train north, I get on the train south because it's so automatic. And that's what Edgeworth is trying to do with some of these lessons. She asks her children and students, her pupils, by the way, when, when I say her children, she never married, never had children, but they're the children she writes to. She asks them to play and practice so that by doing, they learn, and by learning, they become moral. So for her, morality and education were the same. So um, automaticity is something that's pretty important for learning language, for learning education. Uh, let's see, where am I? So, she says, we have found from experience that an early knowledge of the first principles of science may be given in conversation and may be insensibly acquired from the usual incidents of life. If this knowledge be carefully associated with the technical terms which common use preserves in the memory, much of the difficulty of subsequent instruction may be avoided. So these lessons uh, represent universal values 
uh, it's important for students and children to have the opportunity to learn them, and she distinguishes between what is good to learn and what's not, and she prevents lessons as conversations or stories. So when she talks in writing to her students, she says, do this, practice this, try this. Don't take my word for it, you do it yourself. Uh, so she's got practical all over this, and the idea that they have sample language is also important for students. So let's see if I have um, some examples of that. So this is from this is from one of the other works in um, the series. Uh, it's from a story, or at the end of a story called Harry and Lucy. And this is probably one of the earliest dictionaries for children. There were dictionaries that were for students and dictionaries that were for students and clerks. And when I say students, they were often older. But she's clearly trying to aim for young people, like I would say around 10 or less. And what she's trying, so this is really for the parent, but this, so this advertisement and the glossary is for the parent. And well, not, you notice that it's he, but that's the time of pre, you know, awareness of sexism and language. Uh, and it's them who is writing. So the glossary, and I'm not sure how many pages we have it with this, but let's see. So here are a couple of definitions and a couple of words. And you notice that these are not n necessarily normal words. Some of them are normal, like accept. But then we also have air pump. And if you notice also, or if, if you got a chance to quickly look through the um, uh, advertisements. This is for mothers. And also later on, at uh, some point, we'll see that this is for girls as well. And she even addresses girls. So that a girl in the early 19th century, late 18th century, would ask, be asked to understand what an air pump is is pretty extraordinary. Uh, so. Things that associate things that happen at a time when we feel pleasure or pain are remembered. So again, there's some really interesting psychological ideas that she's writing about that was, had not been, quote, discovered by then. Uh, let's see, about here. Ah, so attracted. What I like about this is that it's using an example, a piece of iron is drawn or mo moves towards a magnet, which is placed near it as a feather or a light. And let's see if we have that other one. Piece of, OK. So and then she says, my little boy or girl, when you read this, ask the person who teaches you to show you a magnet or let you try these experiments. So it's not just read this dictionary and take my word for it, or read this dictionary and then, well, you know, move on. But actually, here's an experiment for you. Talk to the person who is doing this, and you will see what I mean. And it also provides an, a different understanding of the word attract than what we're familiar with. So it's more scientific. And so I really like that. We have barometer, behavior, belong. What, a, what is a person's own belonging uh, belong to him? So. We have the definition, and we also have a sentence using it. You can see, though, that this is not the kind of dictionary that has developed over time. So we don't know that uh, belong or behavior. We don't see noun. You know, we don't see parts of speech. We don't see pronunciation. So this is really in the beginning of when dictionaries became important and sort of foundational uh, documents that kind of were essential and also uh, set. You know, the title of my book is Fixing Babel. And in the 17th and 18th century, the lexicographers who were saying, oh my god, the language is like a mess. We're going to fix it, as if, you know, it was broken. 
but also they wanted to fix it as in like get it like stable, get a hold on it. And of course, if you've ever noticed, it's not possible. So people just did really the best that they could. Uh, let's see. Okay. What? So this is a, a couple of pages from my book, and they're kind of. They're not that easy to see right now, but what they are is from Thomas Sheridan's late 18th century dictionary. And he's trying to, this is before the field of linguistics was sort of invented. Again, this is the 18th century when things were just burgeoning. People were just like learning things and knowledge was like bursting out of people's scenes. So he was trying to create an idea of what to do with language and have all these rules. And you've, has, who's learned English as a second or other language as opposed to English as your first? Only one person in the, really, in Brooklyn? Honest to God? All right. So <laughs> I'm surprised you're the only person who'd cop to that. But anyway, so the point is that <laughs> If you've ever tried to learn English spelling after being a child of two or three years old, or even now, my mother can't even, you know, she's like, I can't spell some things. I'm like, it's okay. It's your brain. English spelling isn't normal. And so we also try to link spelling and pronunciation. I would <laughs> advise against that. So what we have here is Sheridan looking at rules and laws of English and trying to kind of shove them into space that, you know, it doesn't work. So look, X has two sounds. TH has two sounds. Then we talk about S. The inability to really get a hold on language and uh, the difference between spelling and sound is Remarkable, especially in English. I'd love to give my students an example of this. And maybe you have seen this, if anybody is linguistically inclined. Are you, anyone? anyone? G yeah, don't say it. <laughs> anybody know what this is pronounced as? Besides the person who knows, you're supposed to guess some kind of bizarro. That's what you're supposed to say. And I'm supposed to say no. Right. OK, I love that because, of course, you're so wrong. Uh, this is, if I were writing in the International Phonetic Alphabet, which hasn't been invented yet, and this is partially what Sheridan's trying to do, and I'll show you when I eventually, if I get time. <laughs> See, there's so much stuff to talk about. Maybe I'll come back next spring break. <laughs> um, so this is what it's, so this is pronounced as in the International Phonetic Alphabet. Fish. And you wonder, how did that happen? I say English. So <laughs> this. And we'll show you a page where Edgeworth tries to uh, simplify this, Sheridan's Dictionary for Children. See that? This is why <laughs> teaching, especially literacy, is very complicated. And I feel very bad for people who try to teach and learn after uh, the age of like three or four. And try to, yes? There's a group, uh, a musical group that's fish, but it's spelled with a P, P H I think. Exactly. Uh, yes. And, well, they are the, what? 
my generation's dead heads, I think. So, yes. Uh, so, th so this is what Sheridan was trying to do. And you can see that no reasonable person could understand that. And this is what Edgeworth and her father tried to do. And you can barely understand that. She makes it a little bit easier by just saying, do this. And Sheridan had been saying, here are all these rules, and here are all these like, other rules, and here are the exceptions to the rules. And here, Edgeworth says, just, just look at this, just here, that. And, but this is still for children, and it's still something that is complicated. <laughs> there we have. Uh, so again, the International Phonetic Alphabet was created at the end of this century. So we've got lexicographers bending over backwards for 100, 150 years trying to figure out how they can make English spelling and the presentation of sounds actually match. Doesn't work. OK, so that's the last page that I have from, uh, from all these books. So the point, how are we doing on time? OK. So the point that I want to talk about is that, another point is that what they're trying to have students do is, again, practice. So they practice language. They, uh, they want to support their own theories. They, they're not interested in saying, oh, these are bad theories of other people, which is what a lot of other pedagogical writers or lexicographers were doing. They're really generous, by the way. Um, so they say, we have no particular system to support. We have no temptation to ta attack the theories of others. Uh, we point out that we l rely entirely upon practice and experience. So what they're trying to do with that is say, look, go ahead and read something else, but this is what we do, and we'll show you and have you practice it. So they have the idea of social literacy here. So when they are teaching about proper handling and usage of play, so they actually kind of teach how to play with things. So they say that children have play and they're given toys to play with, uh, but they're also allowed to break toys, which is a little bit e unheard of. I mean, have you ever, I mean, just imagine the idea that somebody could say, here, take this toy, and if you break it, fine, put it back together. That's part of the learning process. So she, the, in the chapter entitled Toys, presents parents with the idea that they can reinforce positive and negative values. So she has a boy who, instead of attending to his own sensations and learning from his own experiences, he acquires the habit of estimating his pleasure by the taste and judgment of those who happen to be near him. So if he, the boy, she's giving this example of, is around people who don't let him do much and don't let him play with much, and he acquires the ideas and understanding and values of adults. And she contrasts that with uh, and so she also gives examples of toys that shouldn't be touched, like a dollhouse or like a, a, a small carriage that you, know, you would ride in and not like push. And so it's important to actually play with and use and break. So useful toys are sturdy and practical. They require energy. Um, <clears throat> she says there's a cart in which this boy could carry weeds, earth, and stones up the hill. So I have this imaginary idea of like, oh, here, kid, play. And then, you know, it's actually work. <laughs> so, but still, it's not a bad idea to have students or children do things. So pushing something will actually teach physics. And getting dirty is not a terrible thing. Question? I just want to ask, what century were they writing the book? What century? Yeah. Uh, this was late 18th century, so around 1790s, uh, early 19th century, about like 1905 at the latest. So it's, so I'll go back to uh, where, let's see, I'll go back to here 
where you can read the advertisement because it's pretty unusual. Okay, so until children have learned utility, they can't actually do anything with it. So they've got the utility of knowledge and the utility of things. Will derive, uh, they can derive pleasure from it. So the address explained that instead of attending to his own sensations and learning from his own experiences, he acquires the habit of estimating. Okay, so Edgeworth doesn't mean that they should destroy toys, but or you know break them, you know randomly without a purpose. But they can take things apart. Um, there's an interesting uh, section here. The Edgeworth explained that. We were once present at the dissection of a wooden cuckoo, which was attended with extreme pleasure by a large family of children. And it was not the destruction of the plaything which entertained the company, but the site and the manner in which it was constructed. So there are a couple of interesting words here. One is dissection, and one is a large group of a family of children, and it was not the destruction. So. I mean, there's so many words like entertain and construct. So this is a useful thing and practice to do. So they're taking a thing, a cuckoo clock, and taking it apart and learning from it. And that is, that is play that's good and useful in teaching. Uh, the careful contrasting of similar sounding words, so dissect and destruct, so dissect is better than destruct. They emphasize the child's need to experiment and learn how things are done and work by doing them. When a parent participates in this learning process and there's a father who's overseeing but letting the children work with it. When the parent participates, the parent uh, not only imparts knowledge but also experiences it with them. So there's not like a top down sense of learning and information sharing, but it's all bottom up. Uh, let's see. One of the other things she talks about in practical education is the idea of real life. Uh, I mean, she doesn't use the term real life, I do, but it's the idea that we should present children with objects that are from actual life, not necessarily to uh, in the same size or in the same way, but to I give them understanding of what they'll be doing later on. So um, children should be actually shared or uh, art and information like literature should be shared with children. Uh, they shouldn't be hidden from children. They should be taken and shown what things are. They should set a table. They should have, uh, and boys and girls, by the way, should be learning how to set tables. They should understand what a painting is about. What is the history of painting? So it's a discussion of children who are like sponges. and they're trying to impart knowledge to people who are going to learn and understand this knowledge and information and take it and impart it to their own children. So that is this practical education and it's this sending of knowledge and information that becomes automatic. They are going to uh, what am I trying to say? They're going to take it in and it becomes part of their moral philosophy as well. So whatever they do, they can become teachers themselves or they're going to become parents themselves. They will, uh, it's, it's embedded in their memories. So the Edgeworths use simple and repetitive language, by the way. So it's fun, it's lighthearted. Uh, they want to make sure that students feel uh, pleasure and joy from learning. So they understand that you, 
when they talk about learning spelling and pronunciation, they, they let students know that it's okay to make mistakes. Um, let's see. They do something kind of interesting also with teaching, and especially with language and spelling, is the early identification of something like phonics, where they take pieces and chunks of words, and they say, look at this chunk of a word, look at that chunk of a word, and then put them together. So they take parts of words, and then, become, then they become larger words, and then soon they become sentences. Uh, Okay, so I think that what I'm trying to get to is that what happens with the Edgeworths is they provide children with these practical words, these practical examples. Um, some of the other words, by the way, in, in addition to air pump, are barometer, mold, globe, lever, microscope, orrery, that's, an, uh, that's a, uh, an 18th century uh, measuring device, a thermometer. So, and she was clear to address girls and boys. So, I think what I want to close with, if that's okay, is a, to provide you with some early eight, 19th century information about how education was beginning to understand children as actual, you know, minds to mold and social beings, and that the Edgeworths alone, among many at this time, were really respecting children, and they did not consider children to be of lesser value. In fact, they considered children to be of greater value, and they were some of the earliest writers of uh, pedagogical texts, and they didn't refrain from asking children and parents to work together. So what I like about this is that there's, there's joy and beauty and pleasure in the everyday and mundane life. So and it can, everything can be a lesson. Thank you. When I, I mean, I, when I, taught English as a second language, one of the things that at the end of my class is the exit exam that my students take in order to matriculate into the uh, regular credit-bearing classes. And my students in ESL want me to teach to the test. And I try as hard as I can to say, if I teach you how to write properly, you're going to do well on the test anyway. So I have to pretend that I'm teaching to the test and then like, sneak in knowledge and information and learning that they'll get accidentally. So I think that's what a lot of my friends who are teachers end up doing. You can also thank uh, the Bishop Robert Loaf for doing that to you as well because he was one of the most important people in the 18th century to decide that English had to conform, or English grammar and syntax had to conform to the, Engli or the grammar and syntax of Latin, because Latin was the most perfect language. So if anybody has been afraid to split an infinitive or end a sentence with a pr proposition, we can blame Bishop Loth. So, it's a, these are rules for Latin and not rules for English. So just go ahead and split all your infinitives and boldly go, whatever. But the point is, is that, yes, absolutely. Uh, Latin is important, especially in a, con in a country or a city like we are now, uh, in terms of getting a sense of what other languages are like. I, because I have some Latin, I have some Spanish, I have some French, I'm able to communicate with my students who are from other countries better. Um, I'm able to explain to them what other languages are like in terms of structure. So absolutely, it's, it's essential to learn other languages. I mean, that's a whole other thing. We teach as a matter of sort of rule, I guess, the second language in schools in late middle school, early high school which is the worst time to start learning a second language. 
the best time is either at birth or before the age of three or four. And so to learn the structure of another language is great. Um, by the way, this came up the other day. Latin actually isn't dead. Are you all aware of this? Anybody had any access or uh, connection to the court system, legal system? Anybody go to the hospital or the doctor? Right, so we are still using Latin. I got my jury summons a couple of weeks ago, and I luckily put it off until the end of May, but I'm going to be experiencing voir dire. And right. yeah, so uh, certainly Latin is not dead. Uh, and that's another thing. There's no such thing as a, as a dead language as long as there are little bits and pieces left over to study or people who are willing to look at it or um, there's residue of it. So thank you. One of the best things uh, my husband ever did with me was when we were trying to fix our first house was not say, here, you know, female person, I will do this for you, but here's a drill, you figure it out. And, or here's a drill and a book, and we'll do this together. And because he had the knowledge, I didn't. And so now I can say, I can do drywall, and don't touch that corner. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's that actual practicing. And so when we had to fix stairs, I could tell my husband, no, silly, the corner and the stairs and the riser is the same one because geometry. So <laughs> yeah, people say, oh, I'll never need that again. It's like, well, you, you do actually, or you pay someone. So yeah. Well, actually part of this is um, example, the fish example is a result of how English is related to German. So I explained to my students and in a class, that I encourage you to take at my school. Um, it's a, I call it like Englishes or language around the world. And I give to them the first day four examples of the Lord's Prayer. It's Old English, Middle English, Renaissance English, and then Modern English. Because I, and then I say, the next time some older person criticizes you or your friends for ruining the language, ask why they're not speaking Old English. So. These are, this is a leftover from Old English when English was a Germanic language before the French invaded and imposed a Latin uh, element to the language. So, and then when I read to them the Lord's Prayer in Old English or what we think Old English sounds like, I sound like I'm crazy or German or Dutch. And <laughs> They laugh and they think it's hilarious, but this is what we get when we've got these impositions of other languages and other people. And I talk to my students about there are certain ways that languages change, and, there, and this is from another 18th century lexicographer. Conquest, so the Norman conquest, and it's like here is French. It's yours now because we say so. Uh, commerce. Like, we're on the Silk Road, I want your, you know, ivory, you can take my coffee. And so languages change that way. There's a really interesting article recently about how some language, languages got chai and other languages got tea. So don't ever ask for chai tea, you're being redundant. And so conquest, commerce, culture. So I've got a little bit of extra money. I'm going to Italy, and I'm going to bring back all of these fancy terms. You went to Italy? <laughs> You'll like it. <laughs> I just came back. Um, I didn't want to come back. Uh, be careful of the euro and you know dollar problem. <laughs> so, anyway, so conquest, commerce, culture, and I give um, another example to my students of conquest and commerce and culture all at the same time. Uh, so there's, I'm going off topic, which is typical for me, but there's this interesting uh, example that I give to my students where I ask them periodically to look at connecting. Well, so I ask anybody if they've become aware of the term yalla. Yalla. 
Okay, you know that? How do you know that? Right. Anybody who's not Arabic know that term? Had, that, that doesn't count, sorry. Okay. Uh, so this is, well, because it's a transliteration, I could ask you to write it in Arabic or I could write it in Hebrew, but it's really not relevant to English. Uh, so if I were to transliterate, I take the sound, and this is what it would be sort of spelled like, or maybe Y-E-L-L-A-H or something. Okay, and so it's pronounced yalla. Do you want to, can you say it loudly? That's not nearly as loud as, <laughs> okay. So anyway, I, so what I do, what I was trying to get to was uh, Google Ngram. And anybody aware of what Google Ngram does? Besides, you know, Google taking over the world, what you can do is track a word's use over time in published materials. And if I could get to it, I could show you the really cool nature and um, show, I could show you how this word um, increased in printed matter in, in English. And I, you can also choose English or British. And so when we go to Google Ngrams, let me see if it's up. Chrome is, okay. But there you go. Well, spelling is important now, not so much then. Okay. Okay. So let's see, American English. I think it goes to 2008. So let's see. I'll just see, okay. Again, spelling matters. Okay. So let's go from, I want to, okay. So not sure what was going on then, but let's close this down even a little bit more. Okay. So here's an example. Anybody know why after about here we would be seeing an Arabic word entering in American English? Well, not so much 9-11, but after 9-11, right? Because 9-11 was at the end of 2001, yes. I would say that's probably less of where you would, that would have been the 1970s example, I would, I would imagine. This would be the, the wars that resulted after 9-11. Because Yala is, uh, just from my educated guess, American service people coming back with that word. What does it mean? Come on, let's go, come on, go, you know, come, let's go, hurry up. And this is where I get to talk to my students about conquest and culture at the same time. So, and now it's, it's here. Another fun place to look for words. I don't know if you're familiar with this. You students are. That's okay, see it corrects for me. Okay, see, 2003. Now, if you're really looking for serious lexicographical research and evidence, try to avoid places that, you know, <laughs> have this kind of thing on the right. But there are still ads on dictionary.com or Merriam-Webster. But this was, I think, a, a nice way to show the intersection between uh, how things, English is always changing and you can't stop it and you know, just see if you can try. And there are words that are going to be 
in, in English now, or if not now, in a few years. I know that Maria Montessori was about 100 year or so years later. Was she um, early to mid 20th century, or was it? Anybody know particularly about Montessori when she was theorizing? I don't know, but it, it wouldn't surprise me that these ideas were swirling around, but I, I'm not sure, and I certainly don't have the knowledge that there's a, like a direct connection, but uh, this is the kind of thing that people were beginning to pay attention to all over. Uh, in the 19th century. So uh, Webster, by the way, was one of the first American lexicographers, and he wrote uh, uh, pedagogical works for children in America. Did you get it? OK, so a lot can change in you know, 100 years, but still, that's maybe not too far. And so you know, Webster was writing his works for children uh, in the 1820s, 18 teens. So, you know, 50 years later, and also, you know, different culture. But I would suspect that these are not things that just stopped with the Edgeworths, but they picked up and became more important later. Do you think it was a good idea for the church to switch from all services in Latin to permitting the use of the vernacular? Since I am a Jew, <laughs> I have other ideas about the church. Um, but I can tell you from my experience in synagogue that what ends up happening is that people don't learn the language of Hebrew, but they learn the sounds of Hebrew. So when we, because I, I learned Hebrew as a young person, like you learned Latin. So you can actually learn, you know, pre-Vatican II, if, if, Anybody pre Vatican II? So, so um, you could actually understand if you if you could remember what these words meant, but only if you took the language. So what happens when I am in synagogue? I've got people who are reading the sounds of Hebrew next to me who don't know what the words mean. Now, of course. Religiously or liturgically, you could say, well, it's just the sound of the words that's holy. And I suppose that's true, but you don't actually know what you're saying. So changing to the vernacular is meaningful if you want people to know what the words mean and to have a closer connection with the words and the holiness of them. On the other hand, if you, if you want people to know the language, then no, I guess. It's, there's good reasons for both, but you have to be able to know what things mean. Does that help? I, I think if you're going to use the Latin, you should pe teach people what Latin means instead of just he hearing it once a week. She was, I think, really important uh, in terms of promoting her ideas and values. She, she was an important, she was a member of an important family, and she was widely read and respected. She's, her, her reputation is not like Jane Austen's, but when we talk about women writers of that period, Edgeworth and Austen should be talked about in the same way. Uh, but Edgeworth was more important when it comes to teaching children and passing on information. Uh, and in some ways, that's not interesting to scholars, or it hasn't been interesting to scholars, so we haven't really heard about her lately. But I think her ideas and theories have been really uh, foundational. And may, may, if we can make a connection between Edgeworth and Montessori, we would see that what she's done and sh what her father did was really uh, a useful thing. And, I mean, she was one of several and many at the time, but she was also one of the most important and popular. So I, I would say that what she did was really a good thing. And it changed education theory. Women were not allowed to go to university. Um, 
women, and in fact, the, I think the first woman who went to Cambridge or Oxford was in the 19, uh, 1870s or 1880s. So, uh, and it, it would also not have been common for a woman of her stature to go to university. So, believe it or not, there was some argument about, at this time about whether women should be taught to write because writing and reading were taught as separate occurrences. So it was becoming very common. Female literacy was not like male literacy, but it was climbing. So reading for women was more common, but they were still taught, it was still taught as a separate process than writing. And there were, um, there's another scholar, writer at the time named Han Hannah Moore, who, promoted the idea that writing for women was dangerous. Because of course, if you can write to people, you can communicate with them and then you can get scary ideas and you know, change the world. So when I show my students uh, different versions of the Lord's Prayer, uh, it's usually predicated upon that some of them might have had some sort of like religious background, which is not always the case. But I like to figure that there's at least one prayer they might have heard. So it's in Old English, Middle English, Renaissance English, and then Modern English. And luckily, you know, the, diff the four different uh, periods or the four different Englishes are unusual enough, and there's a, you know, several hundred years between them, so you can see the distinctions. And if you search online, you should be able to find variation or variants of the, old, the, the Lord's Prayer in these different languages. I mean, I would say that this, you know, again with the Montessori question, this preceded and sort of laid the foundation for kindergarten. Uh, what I think was this is the result of the Industrial Revolution and people having a little extra money and wanting their children to have maybe a different and better life than they had and also people and you know parents of both kinds you know, mothers and fathers to have a little extra time so they were more involved in their child's education and they were a little bit more educated so this laid the foundation i think for things like kindergarten but it was it was well before it so, thank you.